and welcome to another Read With Me session. I'm yours truly, Isabel Bedell. I'm here in a different location because you know what? We're in Houston, Texas. We're visiting my family um, and we are on the go. But that doesn't stop us from actually pursuing what's most important, which is our education and making sure that we get it in. You know what I'm saying? And by getting it in, we mean our read with me. Okay, so the cool thing about, you know, read with me is that you can do anywhere and all you need, if you want to record it, all you need is your phone. Like I'm literally using my phone. I have the phone stuck in the steering wheel and I'm just recording this. But I did bring my book with me. Okay. And I'm going to continue to read. And if you don't mind, I'm going to be with my sunglasses while I read to you. And the cool thing is like, I'm actually, what's it called? I'm charging the Tesla right now. So there's like perfect amount of time for me to finish this chapter and also get this uh, awesome Model 3 charged up. Okay, are you ready? We're continuing to read Your Next Five Moves by Patrick Beth David, and it's no, chapter number four. We just arrived to move number two, master the ability to reason, okay? Master the ability to reason. And now we're getting into the incredible power of processing issues, which is chapter number four. You have the power to control over your mind. No outside events. Realize this and you will find strength. Ooh. Roman Emperor Marcus Aurelius. This is from meditations. That's strong. And you have the ability to recognize that you have full control over your mind. No one can stop you. That's beautiful. Every day, all day long, we are faced with issues. Your best customer threatens to walk away from you if you don't lower your price. Your star employee says she's leaving if you don't give her equity. A pandemic causes the market to crash 30% in a single month. A bigger competitor is bullying you into trying to put you out of business. Your kid gets into a fight at school. The issues never stop. You constantly hear people talk about the keys to success. It may be the most common question of amateur podcasters, probably because it's safe and simple. You'll hear answers ranging from marry the right person, focus on health, work hard, have faith, and a host of other things. You're going to have moments when you feel as though the world is coming to an end. An amateur panics, but a grandmaster doesn't. People he has to do so staying on an even keel. This is why stoicism is so both important and so challenging. And why Marcus Aurelius and Seneca are sages who have stood this test of time. Emotion can get the best of us and cloud our judgment. And sadly, I've learned this lesson the hard way way too many times. It's why my answer about the keys to success for people at all levels of business is know how to process issues. Know how to process issues. Life is always happening, and the way that you respond is based on how you process issues. Most entrepreneurs don't fail because of flawed business models or an investor who backs out. They fail because they refuse to abandon their preconceived notions about work and life. They refuse to solve and learn from any and all kinds of problems as they arise. Some people say that common sense can't be taught. I can tell you that it can be taught, and it can be learned. Because once you know, and once you learn how to become a more strategic thinker, making important decisions is going to seem like second nature to you. Not long ago, I was a high strung CEO with a horrible temper. In 2013, I had a panic attack that sent me to the hospital and recurred every day for 18 months. The main cause of the panic attacks was indecision. 
what kept me up at night and made my heart beat faster wasn't my workload, which I could handle. The problem was that I could not stop thinking about issues. I would replay every decision and every conversation over and over in my mind. It was eating me up alive and damaging both my business and personal life. I had no peace of mind because I was so worried that I would make a wrong decision. Now, I know what it's like to work 18 hour days and still feel as though you're spinning on your wheels. Like most of us, I've spent my early career chasing certainty and treating every issue as though it were black or white, as though there were one right solution to every problem. And if only I could figure out what it was, it was an unproductive, it was as unproductive as it was exhausting. Oh, I know exactly what he's talking about. I know exactly what he's talking about. And if you are an entrepreneur, if you own your business, or maybe you are a parent, okay? Okay, I feel like these, this like literally one day, my cousin is going to college, I'm with my mom, my, I, we saw my aunt last night and they packed the entire car and they went to Texas A&M to, you know, make sure that my cousin is set up properly and he's all good. So like literally just seeing how amazing my mom has parented me, how amazing my aunt is parenting and my uncle are parenting my cousins. I am so freaking beyond proud of how they've helped them develop their own sense of human self and the way to process things. Because right here, this this is the the key. And I'm so in alignment. It was as unproductive as it was exhausting. If you can't get out of your head and you can't get that process out, you're, you're going in circles. You just keep going in circles and you don't get to where your destination is. If I could learn how to process issues, well, you can too. And I'm going to show you how to solve any problem calmly and effectively, no matter what it takes. Building a business requires you to slay many dragons. Problems are inevitable. You'd better get a grip on solving them. So to do so, you must be processing issues constantly. Number one, processing is the ability to make effective decisions based on access to information information at hand with the highest odds in your favor. Processing is about subjecting every difficult choice, problem, or opportunity you face to a rigorous mental analysis. Processing is playing out strategies, seeing the hidden consequences, and sequencing a series of moves to permanently solve problems. Love that. Love, love, love that. The most important trait to process effectively is taking responsibility. Great processors use the word I and see their role in whatever problem has occurred. They ask questions such as, how did I contribute to this? What did I do to co-create the situation? How can I improve so I'll be better equipped to handle something like this in the future? Poor processors play the victim and blame others and external events rather than seeing how they contributed to the problem. You know you're witnessing a poor processor when you don't hear the word I. You'll hear him say things like, all millennials are lazy. These kids have no work ethic. They are causing my business to suffer. Expert processors replace the word they or you or it with the word I. When dealing with the same issue, the expert processor will say, I'm doing a poor job managing millennials. I need to see what my blind spots are. I need to learn how to better understand them so I know what motivates them, or I need to hire a different demographic. No matter what, it's on me to solve this problem. What differentiates mediocre people from exceptional ones is how deeply they process. Most people are surface level processors, but, the best of the best go much deeper. Long-term thinking versus short-term thinking is the difference between a grandmaster and an amateur. Surface level processors are looking for a quick fix. They are thinking only one move ahead and their goal is to make the issue disappear for now. Deep level processors look beneath the surface for causes. They are thinking several moves ahead and planning a sequence of moves to make sure that the issue doesn't happen again. 
it's more important that you see how most people process issues. Blame and escape are the most common responses. And they may be your initial reaction too. So I get it. We're all human. Reference this list to see which choice you're making. The three approaches to dealing with an issue. One, find someone to blame. It's much easier to externalize the problem than to deal with it. And if you can't identify one person, email all your contacts, telling them to go to hell, followed by a roll of middle finger emojis. Two, find a safe place to which escape. Find a distraction, check Instagram, turn on the news, ESPN or TMZ, pretend that you can multitask by clearing out your inbox. Better yet, call it a day and go home to your warm bed. Number three, find a process. Find a way to process by taking responsibility. Take a deep breath and remind yourself that these are the moments that separate the winners from the losers. The great ones own their role. My bad. These are two simple words that all the great ones use constantly. Winners also use phrases such as, this mistake is on me, and we have no one to blame but ourselves. What do victims do? They blame the software, they blame the market, they blame the team, they blame the customers, they blame managers, they point fingers at everyone but themselves. And as a result, they keep making the same mistakes and they keep losing. I bet you know some of these people. They're the ones who tell you that it's somebody else's fault. It's a constant victim story in the bottomless sea of complaints. Blaming others distracts them from actually seeing themselves as a common factor in all these interactions. The author and the relationship coach, Mark Manson said, I always tell men, if every girl you date is unstable and crazy, that's a reflection of your emotional maturity level. It's a reflection of your confidence or lack of confidence. It's a reflection of your neediness. Contrast victims to winners. They are easy to spot. They're the ones who take ownership of the issues. Kids will say, it's broke. Mature, accountable adults will say, I broke it. Joe Rogan is a perfect example of a leader who holds himself accountable. Rogan has found success in stand-up comedy, acting, martial arts, commenting on the UFC, and his own podcast. In my own view, the key to his success is his ability to process issues and accept the responsibility. He doesn't even hold back any opinions or his thoughts. He simply talks through how his mind operates, and in doing so, gives us a glimpse into how he processes issues. On one of his podcasts, he was venting about how a guy he had partnered with to sell coffee used his platform in a way that didn't sit right with Rogan. You could hear the frustration in his voice. And rather than blaming the other guy, Rogan took responsibility. Rather than saying that he, was, that he had been victimized, he owned his role. And what had happened, his exact words were, I effing bought it. Here we have a problem that we've allowed to be created. He had every right to be angry. Most people would have focused on what the other person did rather than saying he had been sold and was therefore a victim who had been taken advantage of. Rogan owned the fact that he had bought it and co-created the problem by being complicit. When you process issues and take responsibility, you stop blaming others. When you process issues and take responsibility, you stop blaming others. Sure, Rogan started out sounding angry, but as he processed the issue, he said, you know, I feel bad because I like the guy. I don't, I don't even think it's intentional. And in other words, it didn't take him long to realize that the root of his frustration was his own actions. A pro who has been processing issues for decades understands that nobody does anything to him without his allowing it. Rather than becoming better, achievers use adversity as a lever to get better in this case. In this case, Rogan directed his frustration to avoid making the same mistake again. And when most people would be blasting someone else on social media and threatening a lawsuit, Rogan was educating himself. He said, I effing read more about coffee over the last three weeks than I've ever wanted to read or thought I would ever have to. Here are three steps to processing what 
how to take when someone takes you off. This is good. This is good. Because we all have moments where we're like, literally something happens and you're like, this is crazy, you know? But here it is. Number one, take responsibility for your role and what happened. Number two, state specifically what you did to create the problem. And then three, channel your frustration into getting better and preventing future problems. That's winning process in, there, in action. That's an effective approach by a person who has created a habit of tackling issues and using them for learning and growth. It's not innate, now something you learn overnight. Now, however, it can definitely be learned. It can also be taught. If you manage people, you need to go beyond processing issues for yourself. You need to transfer this skill to your managers and your employees. And the best way is by example. When you become a deep level processor, you set the example for how to tackle issues. This is essential to scaling your business. I emphasize that processing issues is the most important skill to master because it's something you'll have to do several times a day. For the rest of your life, for starters, shifting to someone who takes responsibility rather than blaming others, will change everything. You will go from being a victim of circumstances to a person who creates his or her destiny, her reality. Here is how to deal with a crisis. I feel so strongly about taking responsibility and owning your own role and what happens. I feel like a victim is the opposite of being a grandmaster. At the same time, let's recognize that things do happen outside of your control. And as we learned from the pandemic that started at the beginning of 2020, you're going to deal with external forces that have nothing to do with your choices. And many things are not your fault. Negative events happen that are beyond your control. Here are some 10, here are some crises. He lists 10 that are out, outside of your, that can be outside of your control. Health, technology, aka cyber, organizational violence, revenge from a former employee, defamation of character, financial, personal, or market correction, a black swan, personal, even natural. Crises have different lifespans. Some last an hour and others last a quarter or even a year. Just as the stock market can't stand uncertainty, neither can businesses. The unknown is what creates fear. When a crisis does happen, the responsibility of a leader increases tenfold. During heightened uncertainty, too many leaders make the mistake of going quiet. In the absence of a plan, they feel that, staying, that saying nothing is better than saying the wrong thing. Going silent during a crisis is an example of making the easy choice instead of the effective choice. And in fact, the importance of frequent and quality communication magnifies during a crisis. When everyone is freaking out, it's incumbent upon you, the leader, to be the calm in the storm. Decisiveness, resiliency, and calming processing issues are even more critical at this time. The way you react shortens or extends the crisis. So let's put every crisis on a scale from one to 10. What extends or decreases the lifespan of a crisis? Here's one through five your strategies, your level of poise, your over-exaggeration of a crisis turning a three to a nine, your downplaying a crisis turning a nine to a three, your ability to see five moves ahead. There's no reason to blame yourself for an accident or a pandemic. You didn't create the crisis. It's your reaction to the crisis that will determine the life or death of your business. Embrace math and use investment time return. If you think I've gone a bit overboard emphasizing the need to accept responsibility, I plead guilty as charged. So much of processing is about perspective. And instead of blaming external events, you have to shift to seeing yourself as both the creator and the solver of issues. This is hardly a soft skill, and it's one that I can't emphasize enough. I also can't emphasize enough that expert processors possess both emotional and analytical tools. Now let's put those analytical muscles to work. Most issues involve time and money. 
we make bad decisions when we don't factor both into our processing. Amateurs react first and think second. They decide emotionally and rationalize logically. They decide emotionally and rationalize logically. Oh, I'm not going to spend any money on new hires right now when things are iffy. Or they may say, the new software is cool. We've got to get that in place tomorrow. When you hear those statements is emotion. A stoic would advise you to take a more measured approach. The software may be cool, but you have, but have you calculated how long it will take you to pay back your investment? Have you taken the time to figure out the true cost of a new hire? Salary and benefits are only part of the equation, as well as the expected revenue bump that person will create. You can't make decisions without analyzing properly and thinking several moves ahead. I've probably said ITR, investment time return, to my team a million times. Maybe they're tired of hearing me saying it, but they know how valuable it is. And here's the ITR formula. And he has a cool little formula here, the ITR. I is how much will it cost to save us? T is how much time will it take us and save us? And then R is the return. Calculate the return on the money and time involved in the decision. Strong. Before making a decision, start out with the rule of three. By creating three different proposals for dealing with an issue, each with a different price tag. When people don't know how I work, they come to me with an idea and say, here's how much it's going to cost. If they do that, I'll ask them for two other proposals. Having three different proposals slash cost estimates helps stretch the dollar. Having three proposals gives you options for maximizing the value of whatever action you take. And don't tell me that we have only one option. If you think that, you'll inflate rather than stretch your dollars. Next, figure out your time frame. So for instance, if you spend $100,000, you can get something done in six months. But if you spend $200,000, you can finish it in within three months. You can ask yourself, is it worth spending twice the money to get the project done half the time. Making that this determination is a combination of your cash flow and the urgency of the project. If it's a heart attack or if it's heart attack urgent, you'd better spend the additional money. Then again, if you have to borrow to finance the project, you better factor the cost of capital into the equation. After you have calculated the cost and time, figure out the return. So let's say the project costs 200,000 and it will take your a year to complete will lower your risk of losing clients by 8%. You're currently writing $30,000 order a year. 30,000 contracts times 8% equals 2,400 contracts. And if each contract is worth $200, the total returns is 480,000. That's something we'll be implementing within our organization because we're always looking for ways to do um, to use innovative solutions like software and like different ways to you know get better and faster and more efficient and effective. And I believe that one of the best ways that we've actually been able to do that is that we're we're frugally efficient. If we can't do it. How do we expect a coach that's not bringing any money to do it? You know, if we can't fathom investing $2,000 a month on something, how can we expect someone that's not bringing any money to invest that? So is it duplicatable? It's not if we can do it, can someone else do it? Regardless of their situation, right? So that's, I, I'm very proud of that. All right, let's continue. You don't have to be a math genius to figure out that this investment is worth it, but you need to dig a little deeper into the numbers. Make a list of the blind spots or things that could go wrong with the decision. It's easy to think about what could go right, but it's also important to see the downside. Take a page from Dale Carnegie's book, How to Stop Worrying and Start Living, and look at the worst case scenarios. In this situation, the worst that can happen is losing 200,000. Can you live with that? Will it put you out of business? Your decision should be based on knowing what 
your all-in risk will be instead of just winging it or looking solely at the positive potential. People tend to justify their decisions by running a best-case numbers. You need to be realistic with your assumption, even if the investment saved only 4% of the policies. You're still looking at a revenue bump of 240000 If you have to borrow at 12% to finance the project, well, increasing your true expense to 224000 is still worth it. And in fact, it's a, it's a good idea to figure out the break-even of any project before committing to it. I love that. There's no high level math here. You simply need to think through the investment. Investment time return, the ITR formula, and make some sound projections. It doesn't mean that you need an advanced degree in calculus. It just does mean that you can't be lazy with the numbers and you need to think about several different outcomes, which is how you should always think. ITR is a critical skill and one that you'll use time and time again. Great processors rarely repeat their mistakes. Years ago, I had a chance to invest in a pair of company. I liked the fashion and I was impressed by both the product and the personality of the owner, Ray. Plus, I thought an opportunity when Ray was willing to sell 60% of his company for only 100 grand. My business was on fire at the time. I was patting myself on the back for being liquid enough to buy a big equity stake in that business. Why should I bother doing research when Ray was such a sincere and talented guy? Right after the deal closed, I became a lot, I became a lot more popular. And in fact, my phone didn't stop ringing. As soon as word got out of Ray's creditors that he had an investor with deep pockets, they lined up to get their money back. I fought back. I got stubborn. I ended up in far hours that took away from actual I off. I blamed the creditors, I blamed Dre, I blamed everybody, not in Patrick. And I kept digging a, a deeper hole for myself. There's a wise expression that makes perfect sense. When you're in a hole, stop digging. The problem is that when you're in the hole, you're often too angry, too emotional to do anything but fight for your life. Those are the moments when it's important to have smart people around you who aren't afraid to pull you out of the hole. And thankfully, with nudging from my inner circle, I finally relented and threw in the towel on the founder, accepting the loss and getting back to work on my primary business. I was more upset about my decision-making process than about the money itself. I went against my own non-negotiables, investing in an industry I knew nothing about, looking past the personal issues of a charismatic founder, trying to generalize instead of specialize, and it ended up costing me. My gut told me from the beginning that I shouldn't get involved, but I failed to think more than one move ahead. I was surface level processing and I paid a price for it. And when I finally took responsibility, I understood my role in the fiasco. I reflected on all mistakes I had made. I had not done proper research or performed due diligence. I had invested in an industry outside my sphere of competency. I had been both cocky and greedy, and I had failed to remember the this seems too good to be true. It probably is. That's a very intentional there. That's very, very intentional. Once I owned my mistakes, I was left with a closet of clothes to remind me of $100,000 mistakes, not including all the time that I wasted. If you're going to lose, don't lose the lesson. And again, you're going to use experiences to become either bitter or better. To get better, you must reflect on your mistakes. I was reminded of how Magnus Carlsen, after a loss, would analyze every decision he had made to see exactly where how things had gone wrong. Every master, both in chess and in business, learned, learned more than that led to defeat than the ones that led to victory. Mm -hmm. That is wildly true. the eight traits of a great processor. The people I know who are expert processors have different personalities and business strategies, but they share the following eight traits. One, they ask a lot of questions. Having more data leads making better assumptions. What caused this? How can we solve it? How can we prevent it from happening again? 
They don't care about being right or wrong. They're interested on only the truth. Great processors want to handle the situation and move on. If someone else had a better idea, great. Ego doesn't become an obstacle to making the right decision. They don't make excuses. Wasting time and effort on why things went wrong isn't their style. They like to be challenged. Their priority is handling a situation quickly and effectively. If other people have a solution, who calls them to consider their position. They're curious. You can't solve problems without knowledge. Others are always learning more about business and how it works. They love critical details as much as big ideas. They prevent more problems than they solve. People who are really good at processing issues are really good at spotting yellow flags before they turn red. They make great negotiators. Curious problem solvers use logic to find a win for all parties involved. They're more interested in permanently solving a problem than putting a Band-Aid on it. Expert processors. Damn, I freaking love those eight, by the way. Those are freaking all really, really strong. Great processors. Awesome. All right. Expert processors look forward to confronting issues. It's not a coincidence that great processors who process these qualities become leaders. As they build a track record of processing issues logically and efficiently and meet people's needs, they earn the trust of everyone who works with them. Expert processors don't fear issues. They welcome them and they treat them like a game. If your top sales producer threatens to leave you, you start by taking responsibility. This leads you to own the fact that your compensation plan stinks. You have no strategy for retention. Plus, your sales training isn't the best and you need to find ways to improve it. So rather than panicking, you embrace the situation. You say to yourself, not only do we get to figure out how to retain him or her, we will also develop a strategy to build the most loyal sales force in the business. This doesn't mean that you could linger in your realization of a weakness. Instead, it calls for processing it and planning your next moves. Your mindset is everything. When you start viewing a crisis as an opportunity, you are winning the game. I've mentored some great young entrepreneurs during my career, and I've had the privilege of watching them become phenomenal at processing issues. I've seen that skill set elevate them above their peers time and time again. It's why I put processing at the top of my list for aspiring entrepreneurs, as well as for my kids. Once a month, get together in a room with your leadership team, or simply a group of three to five trusted, open-minded peers, and spend an hour focused on the next big problem to solve. What I do in these meetings is bring up issues and let the team have a collaborative debate on the topic. The stronger the debate, the closer we get to the best decision. Listen instead of argue, remain curious. This is the key to entrepreneur success. Make, process, make processing best practices of your company culture. And this ability will seep into the heads of people who will get better and better at using it. It will improve the bottom line, sure, but it will also produce better leaders and better human beings. All the world's problems are issues to be processed. And even though you may not be in a position to solve the world's hunger, you can solve issues in the world in which you live and you work. Most of us don't process issues naturally. It's like marriage. Think about the couples you know have deeper issues and that they're unwilling to address. They avoid certain subjects, problems with sex, in-laws, religion, until they blow up the marriage. Perhaps they manage to stay together for a while and often doing so for the sake of the kids. They're not happy. They may live together, but they're psychologically apart. And when they get older, they can't stand it anymore and they get divorced. They wasted so many years being angry because they've never addressed the issues. When, they, when you refuse to process issues, you live a lie and pay the consequences. Don't waste your time, personally or professionally. If you can learn how to face reality and make decisions based on your own compass, you can succeed in business. The hype you read on the internet would have you believe that some are born with the bug, a natural appetite for risk that leads directly to success. And the truth is a lot more basic. Over a lifetime, success is 
in business, whether as an entrepreneur or an intrapreneur or even in any career choice, requires a particular mindset. It's an aggressive and unyielding approach to solving problems. The best strategies to hone your ability to process issues. Oof, Lord. Yes. I freaking love this guy. I love this guy so much. And I freaking love the whole processing issues thing because Lord knows I want to get better. I can't wait until I can process issues better, faster, more effectively, you know, literally I'm, <laughs> I'm done charging. Thank you for joining me in this process of charging the Tesla. I'm ready to get on with this amazing day. Um, but you know what? I just realized that I need to write all those eight steps down in my journal, like as soon as I get back to the house. And I would love, love, love to even have a conversation with my mother and just be like straight up, like, how do you feel about this? You know, how do you, how do you like this? How do you like that? You know, how do you process issues? Cause I, I love my mom, you know? And I can tell that she's, she's at a different level in her mind, you know, like she's evolved, you know? So I'm really proud of her and I'm really like encouraging um, her to just, you know, do whatever she wants. Like she's, she's always been a giver. She's always been on top of everything. She's always like, always, always, always been such an incredible example of what a selfless, human being can be and how she will always win big because of it. And I think it's one of the ways that she's able to process issues. She never explodes. She never is like, she's just always been pretty zen about things, you know? So I'm, I'm very proud of, of my mom and my dad and my wife. Vanessa is incredible at this guys. So make sure to go, watch her read with me sessions because it's fire but with this I'm so excited for what's to come you know I think I'm gonna I really like doing read with me's in the car maybe that's the thing but that was great okay so I'm glad that I was able to you know share that moment with you I'm I'm excited for what's to come and have a beautiful rest of your day and I shall talk to you very soon see you later bye